Hey, Brooke. Hello. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. Except for the 90-something degree weather out today. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just planted some herbs, and I, I'm hoping they make it through the day. Oh, man. I didn't think about that. All the gardens, including my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, there's something about California. I love California. I just got back from Ventura County. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, I'll never move anywhere else because I just love this state. It's the most beautiful place. For those of you who are outside of California, stay where you're at. We don't need any more people here. <laughs> but um, I'm driving, you know, for, I had court yesterday. So I spent the night in Ventura uh, driving in the morning. And before I hit the traffic, I was in heaven. And you got these beautiful, majestic mountains, man. And when you're tra- passing from Ventura all the way to L.A., even actually, especially when you get into L.A. County, that drive is, is gorgeous. So I'm like in heaven here, okay? Come, you know, it, but I have to say this, there's one similarity of California to Chicago. Chicago is known for having about a sliver. If you look at it a pie, about 10% of that pie is good weather. The rest of it is gray, <laughs> cold, rainy, miserable. You know that because your brother's out in the Midwest, uh, Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. You know, so you've been out there and you know what I'm talking about. But I mean, you know, you walk around there and it's always gray and you're just looking for that little sliver of weather. Here in California, we've got beautiful weather, but it gets hot a lot of times. So you either got like this rainy weather, which I know we need and sometimes it's nice, or you got this boiling hot weather. I just... Could it just stay like, a, you know, the springtime? Nice 72. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only place in the world I think that that I'm aware of, of course, I'm not an expert. I haven't been traveling around the world. But in the Caribbean, especially Antigua, where I've gone a couple of times, there's I check it almost all the time. It's a perfect day over there. It's like 78 degrees all the time. <laughs> we could just open up Schweitzer uh, Caribbean. Oh, I like it. I like it. Hey, clients, have, come on over, man. We'll, we'll, <laughs> I won't pay for your travel, but I will give you a free consultation if you come in person to, to see us over there. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to talk about something serious today, and that is uh, not the Dodgers, not the opening day, because today's opening day, I believe, right? And they're playing away today. Mm-hmm. So our opening day, our real opening day is next week. Okay. Well, there, there's going to be a Mr. Dodgers Neighborhood segment coming soon Yay. regarding that, and uh, we'll bring you in on that. But we're talking about an appellate court decision that this is the first time I've done this on this podcast. I have not read it. I asked you to read it and tell me about it. I know what the basic... Uh, issue is. I don't even know what the holding was, I don't think. So you're going to really educate me along with everybody else about this. So what's the name of the case? It's, I think, Scheinfeld v. Scheinfeld. So that's, I'm guessing, I don't think there's any odd pronunciation there. We could call it in remarriage of Scheinfeld. Well, it's interesting because, yes, that is the name of the case, but the person who is appealing is actually husband's attorney. Oh, so, oh. You know, a little spoiler. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, somebody got in trouble. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell us about it. All right. So the main issue is, as I think you could have guessed, a sanctions issue. So just a little history on this case. Um, there was a DVRO in uh, six. D. I'm sorry, a domestic violence restraining order, um, ordered in June 2017. And as part of that, which is pretty common, um, the wife is allowed to record any violations of that um, DVRO, which is pretty standard. A few months later, there's also a criminal protective order because husband... uh, A-C-P-O. Okay, go ahead. (laughs) We have all the the acronyms. Um, That also allowed a wife to record any violations. And then later that month, she files for dissolution, as is pretty common. Um, hus- hey, wait, 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 wait. Remember, I'm from the Midwest, okay? I not only talk slowly, but I listen slowly. So so what I have here is we've got a divorce, and it, this is a messy one because we have a domestic violence incident that uh, the wife goes in and gets a restraining order mm-hmm. against the husband. Mm-hmm. A permanent one, five years. And simultaneous with that, we've got a criminal case, which we see a lot, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, most of the time, you know, we're representing the victims, but sometimes we even represent the people that are accused, and it completely messes things up for the person that's convicted. Oh, so this this husband in this case has got a double whammy. He's, okay. he's not doing super well right now. Okay. Um, so she files for dissolution um, later that same month as the CPO. In the criminal matter, he's represented by the main lawyer who we're going to be talking about throughout this podcast, and then he also retains her for the dissolution. Um, That same month, again, September 2017 was a big month for these uh, parties. There's a meeting with wife, husband, and husband's lawyer. Wife is in pro per. Okay. 
it sounds Seems like, a little lopsided to me. Well, and just buckle up. It sounds like this meeting really goes off the rails. Um, and she records the meeting because it's a violation of the restraining order, the way that they are speaking, the way husband is speaking oh to her. Oh, my God. I got to hear this. But okay. also the lawyer is being very um, harsh, I guess, for lack of a better word, saying things like, if I were him, I would have hit you, too. You've um, got to be kidding me. So just very... Wait, 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 wait. Is this a family law attorney or a criminal defense attorney? I did not look her up, but she... Um, I mean, she represented him in the criminal matter first. And and so I'll ask you a little bit a little bit differently. We don't want to call somebody out on this, but maybe not. So anyways, so what are they talking about during the seven? They must be talking about the family law stuff. It, yes, I think so, because it's already the criminal matter's already been... So, so they're representing... She's representing in some fashion for their family law case. Oh, yes. They're in a settlement conference. Wife, is it a secret recording? You know, they actually don't say if she makes it clear she's recording. She um, probably didn't. I would assume but not. But she already had authority, But she had authority, so she didn't have to... Okay. But before you go any further, I just want to say this. I, you're, you're probably going to spoil it for me, but or you're going to correct me on this. Normally, the restraining order says that you can record conversations of, of the other party's phone calls. But apparently, this order allowed her just to record, record conversations. Record violations. Of um, violations. Yes, so it authorized... The criminal matter author, I'm sorry, the criminal protective order authorized her to record any violations. Oh, the, of the criminal pro- protective order did. Okay. As well as the DVRO. Oh, okay. So she had, yes, and again, so the, the DVRO authorized wife to record any violations of the okay. DVRO. Okay, I, I don't want to spoil this because you're telling a great story and I'm mixing it up and I shouldn't be doing this. But how do you know whether or not somebody's violating the thing? You know, you know it's like, are you anticipating that? This person's going to violate the law in the conversation, or you know, it's it's a tricky one for me, you know. And so uh, I assume that there were things that were said that were getting close to the line or across the line, and suddenly she's like recording it. So. I think that's what happened okay. because they they were allowed to have contact except for um, they were sorry he was prohibited from contacting her except for court ordered visitation, and then she I guess by agreeing to this meeting. There's probably some loophole, just like if they both showed up in court, it wouldn't be a violation. Um, but then he started berating her as well, which is obviously not that peaceful conduct that usually goes along with the exceptions. Um, they don't get into it too much. It's probably the most interesting part of the this case, but it's actually not the most um, relevant to our discussion, unfortunately. I could I feel like I could talk about this all day. Well, go very, ahead. Good. This is a so, great case. It's just so interesting that you know an attorney would do that to... Uh, even... Well, you know what? I would uh, punch you right in the nose too. <laughs> Boy, that's great lawyering, isn't I, it? Can you imagine? I, I know. I know what you're gonna. What's gonna happen? He's gonna say, "But this was privileged communications. This was settlement communications, right?" Go, well, but a, but well, a, he doesn't. She does. The attorney actually is a female, so oh, it's okay. the attorney who okay. she does make that argument. Yeah, but, um, I could, but tell your story. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so um, then a year later, so she records this hearing, uh, this meeting. Uh, nothing really goes forward, and then he files in about a year later an RFO for joint custody. As frequent viewers of our podcast likely know, if you have a DVRO against you, it can very much or it does very much affect your custodial rights, uh, among other things. So that's a pretty uh, tall mountain to climb for him to get joint legal and physical custody. Um, He's asking for joint or sole joint. Right. Okay. Um, in the RFO, he includes ex- excerpts from a 730 evaluation that was done on wife in a previous dissolution. <laughs> I see your fa- you're shocked. Well, you would think that people wouldn't do that anymore after the famous case that mm-hmm. came down. Uh, we won't mention that attorney's name. But so are you saying that the the husband introduced the information or the the attorney intru- introduced the Well, the they both did. They both did. Okay. They, you know, she signed off on it. Oh, my God. He signed off on it. Um, wife responded. Uh, she opposes the request regarding custody. And then she also asks for sanctions per uh, family code section 30, wait, 3111. How are we? 3111? Any way you want. Three, not, three, 3111. That's probably not the right. I don't, that doesn't 3111. 3111. Okay. <laughs> uh, D and 3025.5. 
and she included a transcript of the previous meeting. So we sort of have two different issues going on. We're asking for sanctions, and we're saying he should not have custody. Look at him kind of violating this this okay. issue. Um, there's a hearing. Is this, this is a Los Angeles case? No, it's uh, I believe it's San Diego. Okay. So that, not anyone we know. Okay. Maybe. Um, there's a hearing, and that, that hearing, the court says that custody visitation and sanctions would all be decided at trial. There's a trial readiness conference later, which identified again the issues for trial, which include the sanctions. And then wife filed a trial brief that included her request for sanctions. Husband and his counsel didn't file a trial brief, so they didn't okay, respond. This attorney was not a, a practicing family law attorney. I don't this think somebody so. that thinks, if I could do criminal law, I could do family law, and it's just about kids and stuff you know you know i do the hard work and you know that's what is going on here oh, this is not definitely. a family law practitioner you didn't even file a brief nope okay okay so incompetent so far so go ahead so as you would expect um the the case doesn't actually even get into the visitation or what was ordered um but it does order a ten thousand dollars in sanctions payable by husband and fifteen thousand dollars in sanctions payable by his attorney <sighs> Whew. it's a lot Whew. so which brings us to this case. Well, let, let me ask you. So the, at the trial court level, it was how much against the the, the husband? 10000 And what was the sanction for? Violation of uh, 3111. Of, of, you mean the restraining order or no? No. Oh, uh, about the custody evaluation. Uh, so the husband was, was actually, mm-hmm. that's interesting because in the prior case, the Seminole case on this, uh, only the attorney was sanctioned. Not the party. No, he did. It was for both of them. So they both got sanctioned. Was the was the hus- the was the husband's attorney also sanctioned for the same thing? Thirty one eleven. Okay. So that's the main issue. So, actually, so let, in this let's case. lay this out for our viewers who uh, maybe not have seen the prior podcast, <laughs> uh, but there is a code that says what? That says that these confidential evaluations cannot be disclosed to. It basically only says it can be disclosed to the other party uh, le- officials um, and the court if deemed necessary. Yeah, so so what has always been the case is the child custody evaluator's reports are deemed to be confidential because it contains a lot of personal information. And the Family Code carved out uh, an exception to public records, basically, and said, we're going to treat these evaluators' reports with kid gloves. We're not going to let this get into the hands of people that don't need to know. And what that means is, is that there's only going to be a limited amount of people that could actually read this thing. Um, and that's going to be the court. Uh, it's going to be the attorneys. The parties could read it. Uh, but that's kind of it. There might be another exception, maybe the court clerk or something. But you know, if you violate this thing, there can be sanctions, and in the Seminole case, there was a sanction of about it was close to fifty, sixty thousand uh, dollars, because in that case, they, the same thing they brought in the evaluator's report mm-hmm. from a prior marriage of a guy that they were uh, doing a uh, uh, deposition over. It had you know in interesting facts, but in this case, it's the same thing, less of a fine, but the same violation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, the lawyer appealed, and basically her arguments were 33, I'm sorry, 3111 didn't apply to lawyers. She didn't receive proper notice, um, which would comply with due process. The court lacked personal jurisdiction. She gets into the safe harbor provision, but I don't think it's worth discussing is too it the much. Settlement, and, you mean, or what's a safe harbor? What is that? It was something I had not really even thought. It, I, it's, I've never come across it when we're doing work, but basically it says that you can pull um pull a filing a frivolous fi- filing and avoid sanctions okay I, we don't, I, apparently the court of appeal w- didn't uh, buy into that so it we, was a very short okay. part okay. and then she also kind of separately was appealing um the use of the transcript saying it was improperly admitted and improperly relied upon i don't really know how that would affect her so much um and why she's wasting time appealing that you know if husband wanted to appeal it maybe but it just seemed a little odd to me. Um, and so unsurprisingly to me, the Court of Appeals upheld the trial court's decision. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, it, it, the lawyer sort of threw everything against the wall. They always so, do. Yeah. So they had to respond to a lot of things. But I thought one of the most interesting um, arguments the court, or what the court was persuaded by, was looking at 
Family Code 3111 and looking, one, at the plain language. Um, I felt like I was back in law school, you know, all the different ways to read an argument. Uh, but more importantly is the policy and the intent behind uh, that, you know, that statute. Um, these evaluations are very important, but they are getting into very sensitive information and they want full uh, cooperation. And you're not going to sit there and sit with some person you've never met, you don't know, you have no relationship, who's evaluating you, who can make big decisions if, and be honest, if there's, um, you know, a chance of people reading it. Um, you know, you're getting into delicate things even regarding your children. Psych tests. Yeah, you don't want that on the record. Addictions. Uh, a lot of times the evaluator is not correct. I mean, we go to a court a lot of times where we impeach the evaluator mm -hmm. because they're biased and they listen to one of the parties and they believe everything that's said and it's completely untrue. Right. It gets in the public record about personal matters mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. And then the other reason that they found that the legislator passed 3111 um, is really to deter people from doing that. So we have this cooperation. It's it's not sanctions like, oh, well, you you know, you kind of wasted the other party's time and they had to spend money. Like, no, this is kind of a, a punishment sort of thing. They do not want you doing this. And I think that's why the, the court came down so hard. Obviously not as hard as in the previous case we've referenced, but this is still a $15,000 sanction against an attorney is, is pretty high. Well, it's significant too, because if it's over $1,000, they have to report it to the state bar. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I tried to look and see if it was on this attorney's um, profile, not but yet. not yet. Oh, you're right. It just came. Yeah. Um, and then they also compared it to 271 sanctions. Um, I thought something else that was interesting is the lawyer pointed to the language of 3111 saying it applies to a disclosing party. And she said, I'm not a party to this case. Um, but as we all learned in our ethics class, uh, you as an officer of the court have a duty to the court. Um, and then this sort of gets into her argument about personal jurisdiction as well. Um, that the court has personal jurisdiction over an attorney um, when they are, you know, part of the the case. You can't say you don't have personal jurisdiction over me. Um, that is an interesting concept. I've never read that before. Wow. It seems interesting that she raised it. You know, it's again one of those. Yeah. I think throwing it against the wall. Yeah. Um, but I did like how the the court responded to it, saying, you know, as an attorney, as an officer of the court, you are, you are one of the parties. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. Um. The other, another argument she made that I thought was interesting was that she didn't have the proper notice, which is an interesting ar uh, argument because, one, she had the response, uh, responsive declaration, which was asking for those sanctions. There was the hearing in which the judge said this is going to be an issue. There was the trial readiness conference, which it was brought up again. And then there was also the trial brief. Which again, so where was the lack of notice? She was trying to argue that there needed to be a separate oh, I know that RFO, which yeah. we know is not true. Yeah, there we, used to be a belief out in family law that you had to send out some kind of a formal notice on pleading that we will be seeking sanctions against you and all that. You know, and and if you didn't do that, then you couldn't ask for sanctions. Well, there's been some appellate court decisions mm -hmm. that have said it doesn't have to be that formal. You yeah. know, in fact, the motion itself is notice, isn't it? Well, and it wasn't even you know, wife's motion, there's, they said it's enough that she asked for that affirmative relief in her response. So even though that was noticed. it wasn't brought yeah. up in the RFO, it was noticed in the response. Mm. That was Those were the main arguments they were trying to make. Um, and then the court did rule that the recording was admissible, which isn't shocking. I, I don't know why she included that, like well, I said. Well, but I got to tell you that. I, we got a lot to talk about here. Go, go and conclude, but we got some, some questions to ask about this. Okay. So I think it was pretty obviously going to be um, it was obviously going to be accepted because they had the authority to record. She okay, wait, 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 wait! Don't tell me that the attorney didn't say this can't come in because this was settlement. This was privileged communications. She tried to make the argument, okay. but it's not privileged. Why? Because she doesn't have a duty. There's no attorney-client privilege between wife and husband's attorney. No, but let's let's assume that they started talking about child custody. And something was said during that that was, you know, off color or a threat. You know, um, you know what? You don't deserve the damn kids. And you know what? I would have done the same thing. Um, you, you know, there's a circle of of privilege, right? In that in that communications. So 
there must be one way to invade that privilege. And is it because you're committing a crime or you're? Doing... I think because it was a violation of the restraining order, which is exactly why she was authorized to make these. Recordings. My guess is going to say that those weren't privileged communications. That was a violation of a restraining, restraining order. order. Okay, I got it. Now let me ask you this: Why did they, they talk more about what the attorney said? I mean, there, shouldn't she have been like? He, there should have been a sanction of fifty thousand dollars for that. There's nothing in this appellate court decision that talks about. You said that you would punch her in the face too. <laughs> they they mentioned it, and it almost is like there was a lot to get to. We had so many different things we had to address that this was. I, I wonder, maybe I don't. You know, certainly I think that the maybe the I don't know certainly, but it seems like the state bar might be interested in that. You know, um, it, it and if it's not, then. That's not the way that attorneys should conduct themselves. That's a horrible thing to say to somebody. As an attorney, you're supposed to be professional. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, you know what? You, you deserved it. You know, I would have smacked you the same. I probably would have hit you harder, right? Yeah, good good lawyering, lady. I'm offended by that. You know, and, and frankly, you know, I just wish that there was something brought up, you know, on appeal that would have said that the trial court was wrong for not sanctioning further for that. I agree. I, I mean, we have a lot of opposing parties, opposing counsels oh, yeah. who are, you know, difficult, for lack of a better word, and we are always extremely polite. You have to be, um, you know, not only just because of the professionalism, but it's to your client's benefit to have a decent relationship with everyone involved in this litigation. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, this is going way off topic, kind of way off topic. Um, I was listening to a podcast of Joe Rogan mm -hmm. talking with a famous mixed martial artist. You don't know him because you don't follow that great <laughs> sport. His name is Bisbing. He's retired now. He's one of the commentators. But he was talking, Bisbing was talking about when he was uh, fighting, he had a coach that really was able to finally settle him down to the point where he didn't get too down and he didn't get too up. And when he was in the fight, you know, that he didn't get exceedingly angry. And they both agreed that at a high level, you know, you have to be cool. Now, you, of course, your adrenaline's up and stuff. But once you start getting those emotions like that, mm -hmm. you know, there's a problem there. You can't you know? think the right way. You yeah. can't, you know, even your movements, I would imagine, are off. Yeah, yeah. So so the other thing that, that I want to uh, address is the uh, policy behind the custody evaluation. At this case, I haven't read it, but you've already taught me something that just came to my mind. And that is, is that... What's the real policy behind this? You know, of course, there's sensitive information. We already talked about this. I, many people don't realize this, but when people go through custody evaluations, they have to fill out a very long, not fill out, they've got to uh, submit themselves to a psychological exam, which is never really used at trial. It's crazy. But they got to go through this like two hour thing, and then they're always looking bad. This person's uh, got tendencies of being narciss narcissistic, you know, this person uh, tends to lie a lot, you know, but you know what, we don't really look at that. It's what they say at the trial, but it's humiliating, right? right? So there's information like that. But isn't that what happens at trial? I mean, you know, a hubby takes a stand and starts talking about, yeah, she used to uh, hide her uh, uh, sleeping pills, you know, under her pillow or, you know, all this r very personal stuff, right? So what's the difference there? I'll tell you what I'll tell you what the difference okay. is. The difference is the report, you're not it's not subject to cross examination before it gets in the hands of people, right? If it's in public, I mean people have the right to put on a hearing, defend themselves in, in things. It's not in the report. And again, the evaluator could get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of lot of stuff in there that's just gonna be unchallenged. You can't these reports are a hundred pages long, right? You can't challenge everything, you know, and you don't get a chance to do a response to that and say, here, you, uh, you could give the report to them, but give my response mm -hmm. too, right? So it could be very damaging, particularly if it if it's a uh, notable person and you get into the public eye and stuff, right? Oh, definitely. Okay. So I think that we just created a new policy decision, right? So I like that. Yeah. Well, and I also think there there's kind of a cynical part of me that they're hoping that these custody evaluations, I think the court is hoping that these custody evaluations, once you start reading it, the parties realize maybe it's not great to go to trial on this and maybe we can kind of come and settle. There's some pretty damning things in here and if it's not gonna maybe come out as part of a report, you know, I've just, you know, the, sort of the, as the other side has a, a roadmap of kind of what to ask me or maybe how they want to paint me. Um, 
so maybe they're thinking that they're going to better the chances of a settlement as well by ordering these evaluations. Well, okay, so now you're talking about you know whether these evaluations should be ordered, and you know you're uh, too young to know this, but there was a time where these evaluations were being produced like a like a paper mill. Oh, really? I mean, oh my God, yeah. Almost every case that you had, there was a custody evaluation, and it was one after another, and you'd be waiting. So I had one evaluation with the evaluator would take vacations. <laughs> you know, she would, I'll be in Hawaii for like three months and I'll pick up where I'm at and stuff. I think it took like nine months. $45,000 later, it comes out. And she was actually a very good evaluator. I mean, by the time she was done, I was impressed with the fact that I thought that she was very fair-minded and she did a good job. But what really strikes a lot of people, and this is why we're seeing a lot less of them, I think, is because it's kind of the judge abdicating his or her duty to really look at the evidence. Now, I think that the good part of a custody evaluation is the evaluator could dig really deep and could talk to third parties and and really uh, get documents like uh, documents from DCFS. So they could do an investigation, and that's a good thing, you know, that somebody's digging in there, really looking at it. But it became a rubber stamp thing, boom, mm. boom, boom, you know, and. Uh, Kalodny, uh, rest his soul, one of the most famous uh, divorce attorneys in the world, uh, used to say that we should just get rid of them all together, just put on the evidence. I don't know if I agree with that completely, but I think that everybody should know that those reports are not gospel, you know, especially like, you know, we do a lot of uh, move away cases and, uh, you know, we challenge the evaluators when they have an obvious bias in stuff, you know, and we've been successful, fortunately, but there are, you know, some people that don't know how to contest that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. Yeah. And so, you know, the judge rubber stamp it. Right. So cool. That. Cool. Well, this was wonderful. You were I'm great. So happy. Well, thank you. I know I felt like I was back in law school again. I think I said that already. Just going through the you case. Know, it's good. It's nice though reading cases though. You know, it, you're, you're right. Is As an attorney, people don't realize this, but you're not looking at the cases as thoroughly as when you were in law school. Oh, yeah. No, you know, I have all my notes. Like this was, her, these were her arguments. This was, yeah. But I, you know, I was we're, nice. we're going to send you back to USC and you're going to start teaching this stuff, man. <laughs> I love it. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.